Now I would like to introduce Dr. Adams. He is a critical care physician in the Northern California Bay Area. He finished his critical care fellowship at Cleveland Clinic and has diverse experience providing on-site and remote critical care services to various patient populations across the United States. He is affiliated with numerous hospitals and um, has his clinical professorships at Toro University, Clinical North State University, and Creighton University School of Medicine. He serves as the National Tele-ICU Director for Sound Critical Care. Welcome, Dr. Adams, and thank you very much for presenting the webinar, AHA Guidelines for Post-Cardiac Arrest. This topic is extremely near and dear uh, to my heart. The specific topic today is around post-cardiac arrest and EEG, specifically in community hospitals. And probably like many of you um, may have come from a large academic center, but um, you know the application of some of the guidelines in the community setting can be challenging at times. And so that's what I want to highlight today a little bit and really um, have an open dialogue at the end of this. Um, after we sort of go through the literature and the data and some of the technology, uh, the newer technology around how we implement this uh, guideline. So um, by disclosure, um, I, I just want to uh, make everyone aware I'm a speaker uh, and a paid consultant by Sarah Bell. Um, I certainly want to reflect that the opinions presented in this um, presentation are my own and uh, do not reflect any organization that I'm affiliated with. And certainly please consult Sarah Bell for the use of uh, any device, EEG device, uh, if you're going to be applying these on your patients. So um, today, the outline uh, today, I wanna highlight three uh, components. Um, the first is to sort of discuss the topic around cardiac arrest um, that probably many of you are familiar with. The second topic being uh, really highlight and drill into the American Heart Association guidelines and, uh, and the recommendation for EEG. And then um, summarize um, two cases, uh, kind of a case review. We have many and I have many, but uh, really uh, just to highlight two use cases here to kind of solidify uh, the two topics, cardiac arrest and AHA guidelines. So let's dive in. Uh, cardiac arrest. So the history of CPR and the cardiac arrest management is a, is, a, is a unique story, and it really started many, many years ago, many centuries ago, um, all the way from the bellows um, uh, going into England, turning patients on their side and back on their backs, uh, to what we know and see today from defibrillators and then all the way to um, you know, CPR, large CPR courses and teaching uh, bystanders um, how to um, provide uh, CPR after sudden cardiac arrest. And despite all of this, it still remains a large problem. And, and uh, I highlighted here that there's an estimated 350,000 people who present with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest in the United States each year. This does not include the in-hospital cardiac arrest patient population. So this is certainly a large number. And despite all of those, there's still um, extremely poor survival, survival rates and quality of, uh, quality of life um, after, they, uh, after a patient has had a cardiac arrest. But with improved aggressive support in our ICUs across the country, um, we can help each and every of our patients um, have a better outcome. And this is really um, in part the initial assessment and focus of the etiology of the arrest, managing these complications, and then providing these care in the ICU. And there's no doubt um, that, this, uh, that this process that I just described uh, is a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, from the RTs to the resp uh, to the nurses to cardiology to neurology to intensivists, all across um, the hospital um, to help these patients. So, as we look across the chain of survival for these patients, there are factors that I think we can influence um, as organization as healthcare providers, and I think that they potentially certainly have outcome. <clears throat> outcomes um, 
uh, that can that can provide better outcomes for these patients. And so, control our controllables here. Uh, you know, witnessed cardiac arrest with early bystander CPR. I won't be highlighting any of that today, um, but that's certainly one aspect of having a better outcome. Early defibrillation, as you look across um, in-hospital cardiac arrest, which is this top portion here, the in-hospital cardiac arrest and the chain of survival, early defibrillation is certainly a key one. Out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and early defibrillation is certainly a key factor. Um, perhaps the duration of a non-perfusing rhythm may, um, may be significant in thinking about the outcomes of these patients. Age of the patient, now this is not a factor we can control, but this may, may play into the outcome. And then the last thing that I, I would like to highlight for the remainder of this talk is really things that we can influence as providers, specifically in the ICU and in the hospital. And this is the idea around uh, targeted temperature management and then the post court cardiac arrest management. So many of you are familiar, this is um, the 2020 CPR and ECC guidelines um, that came out. And really after the uh, patient either in hospital or out of hospital has a cardiac arrest with ROS, so after they have return of spontaneous circulation and that's obtained, there's an initial stabilization phase. And I won't get into this, but this is the initial stabilization phase that has a lot to do with the hemodynamic monitoring, management of airways, obtaining the EKG, which ultimately drives towards what's the etiology of this cardiac arrest, and then getting a, a multidisciplinary uh, team approach into the patient's management. And as we go on, um, if the patient has achieved re return of spontaneous circulation, but does not initially have purposeful neurologic activity on exam, oftentimes we move on to perform targeted temperature management and uh, otherwise therapeutic hypothermia. And um, it, you know, we, we typically recommend in our ICUs, and I think this is a national standard, that the controlling the core body temperature and targeting anywhere between 32 and 33, 36 degrees Celsius for 12, uh, 12 to 24 hours, we typically do 24 hours. Um, coupled with this proactive avoidance of fever for 48 hours after discontinuation of TTM. So this is how we manage our patients. And what this looks like, and all of you are very familiar, what this looks like is you certainly have um, this induction phase. So our patients come to us post-cardiac at rest, return of spontaneous circulation. They come to us with some temperature. Now, oftentimes this may be 36 or even febrile, or it may be even 33 degrees Celsius as they come to us, but there generally is an induction phase of this um, management. And then we keep these patients cool for 12 to 24 hours, and then we rewarm them uh, at, at a specific rate and then keep them normal thermic um, for 48 hours plus after that. The time to initiation of this can be up to four, four hours, at least in the published literatures. We want to start this as soon as we can, generally speaking. But the interesting part about this is as we look across the time to initiation, induction, rewarming, and normal thermia, um, uh, the patients can uh, often experience um, the non-convulsive seizures or, or seizure in general. And this incidence is high, and, and it may be even higher than we expect. And this was just one uh, study that I'll highlight that up to uh, one out of every three patients may be experiencing seizures uh, during this period. And this isn't new. You know, if, you look at, if we look across the board as far as our ICUs go, um, non-convulsive seizures can be um, uh, an unrecognized phenomenon across many, many etiologies. And so the prevalence of seizures, as you see here in this slide, um, you know, ranges depending on what, um, you know, what the cause of, what the cause of those seizures may be, or at least um, involved in these seizures as brain tumors, traumatic brain injury, subarachnoid hemorrhage, cardiac arrest being one of these. 
And so, um, you know, the, the reported incidence of non-convulsive seizures in critically ill patients, again, ranges between 80 and 60 percent, depending on the literature you're looking at. The incidence of post-cardiac arrest patients is suggested to be anywhere between 15 and 44 percent. High, high number. And because of that, I think the AHA guideline has come out and recommended that we do EEGs frequently and often. So what does this look like in um, an algorithm that's published? Well, um, you know, the recommendation now is that EEG should be promptly performed and they should be interpreted for the diagnosis of seizures in comatose patients after return of spontaneous circulation. So if you look at the figure on the right, uh, what this ultimately means is, is that as the patients come in, are they following commands? If they're following commands and they're awake, uh, they'll go down a separate algorithm that you'll see on the right. But if they're not and they're comatose, then the AHA recommends that we do perform targeted temperature management. We obtain some brain imaging. Now, this um, it recommended a brain CT. This may be an MRI uh, if available at that particular hospital, other critical care ma management. But I do want to highlight now that EEG is certainly on the algorithm here. And this poses a problem uh, for many hospitals across the U.S., especially our smaller community hospitals where there's just no availability of a tech or the availability of an EEG machine uh, to perform this. And as, we, as we're going to be pointing out in just a minute here, um, it, it's extremely important that we are, um, we are obtaining EEGs for these patients. So I'm gonna back up just two, um, uh, uh, two minutes here and really just highlight this idea around status epilepticus. It is a medical emergency, and I think by all guidelines, by all uh, reports, that this is something we should be recognizing. So the temporal threshold that really defines a prolonged seizure is um, five minutes for convulsive status and 10 minutes for non-convulsive status. I think most clinicians uh, and bedside providers can recognize convulsive status very quickly. You know, the patients, um, certainly this is a very... Um, extreme situa situation oftentimes that we can identify this convulsive status epilepticus, the patient's moving, and, and, and it's, it's certainly identifiable. Uh, now, the non-convulsive seizures are slightly different here because they're oftentimes referred as to as subclinical seizures. They are not on physical exam showing signs that they are actively having seizures on physical exams, and therefore you need, certainly need an EEG to detect them. And some of the negative and positive symptoms that we see in non-convulsive patients can be just simple coma, confusion, lethargy, um, mistaken for catatonia or amnesia, aphasia, and these kinds of things. And so it's important that we utilize our physical exam findings, but go on to um, obtain EEGs to determine if they're having non-convulsive seizures. Why is that important? Well, it's extremely important because, um, and this is an older study back from 1993 in the San Francisco area with Lonestein and Brian Aldridge, but uh, this was this a study that showed that the percentage of patients responding to first-line treatment um, goes down as the duration of seizures uh, in hours on the x-axis uh, goes up. So the longer that the patient is having seizures or is in status, um, uh, the more medications it takes to break them, or certainly the first-line medications are not uh, working uh, uh, as often as it's frequently in a percentage way. So pivoting back to our post-cardiac arrest patients, seizure is common, there's no doubt. In this paper in 2011, uh, this showed that non-convulsive seizures occurred in 12% of our post-cardiac arrest patients who received targeted temperature management. Similarly, in a paper published with Knight and colleagues, um, one out of every three patients in the post-cardiac arrest had seizures, and of those 15% that had these seizures, had them during the cooling phase of targeted temperature management. Another few studies, hopefully I don't have to convince you too much more, but that 29% of post-cardiac arrest patients had uh, seizures in this particular study and the seizures were predictive of a poor outcome. It's always a question between a chicken and egg here, whether 
um, you know, the cause and effect, but certainly this was uh, something that really um, rose our eyebrows as far as uh, looking at uh, seizures and outcomes. Um, another study in 2015 uh, showed that the normal tracing uh, 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 less than 24 hours was associated with good out outcomes and the lack of normal tracing was a predictor of poor outcomes. So um, hopefully I don't have to convince you too much that time is brain. You know, making the seizure diagnosis quickly, uh, certainly based on Lowenstein's literature early on and then uh, well validated now that really making the seizure diagnosis quickly and rapidly is important. And then this in turn also by ruling out seizures to prevent overtreatment of our patients that don't need it. And hence came, um, you know, this technology that we often use and I use in my ICUs um, today is, is this a technology uh, that was uh, developed here in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is Cerebell Rapid Response EEG. And, and, this, um, a, a, and this is the headband here that we utilize. As you can see, it goes on the patient um, and, uh, and can be placed on the patient by really a nurse or a respiratory therapist that certainly doesn't need an EEG technician. And, um, and it has four components that we utilize. It has a bedside EEG display, so I'm not a neurologist. I'm a practicing intensivist, and so uh, I cannot formally read EEGs, but it's certainly, if, you're, if you have that capability, you're able to read an EEG bedside. Um, there's also a sonification po component of this, so you can listen. It takes the EEG waveforms and transforms it into a, an audible tone that you can help detect if this patient's having seizures. Uh, there's a cloud portal that um, the neurologist can look at to look at these EEGs. And then there's this uh, AI algorithm that I'm going to highlight in one of our cases uh, at the end of this talk that looks at the EEG, constantly monitors it, and then determines if the patient's having status epilepticus or seizure-like activity. And so as we get back to the utilization of EEG and post-cardiac arrest, I think, you know, this is still a developing literature uh, and, and guidelines around EEG, timing of EEG, duration of EEG. And so when I specifically think about the community setting or the community hospitals in which many of us practice, what does this look like? Um, well, uh, you know, it would be, let's call it ideal, let's say, to put every cooled or targeted temperature management patient on continuous EEG for the duration of their ICU, but that's pragmatically not able and not feasible. And so we uh, do what's next best, and that is that in our institutions um, where we don't have availability of EEG techs or continuous EEG, or we cannot transfer these patients, um, we put uh, the Cerebell device on it. So we look at um, two different um, uh, uh, timing for this in that we put EEGs on as quickly as we can as soon as the, um, the decision is made that this patient needs to go under targeted temperature uh, management. So the patient has a cardiac arrest uh, with return of spontaneous circulation and uh, cognitively, we decide that this patient is not waking up, they're comatose, and so we're going to institute targeted temperature management. Well, we then put um, an EEG device on these patients to monitor them during this induction phase. And, um, you know, this device can be utilized up to 24 hours. We typically leave it on at least until the patient is cooled and then maintained at that cooling temperature, and then oftentimes take it off then. And then as we start to rewarm these patients, uh, we then place the EEG back on. The purposes of this really is, is that we cannot leave uh, this on necessarily their entire duration, 96 hours, uh, but we want to target the, the highest risk sections that, that, that I believe um, the patient could be seizing. So that's in the, in the induction phase, the rewarming phase, and then the normal thermia phase. That's not to say that we don't use spot EEGs in between here, especially, and I'm going to highlight one other key caveat here, especially as we have to paralyze these patients, and we often do um, during uh, shivering or ventilator synchrony and these kinds of things, that we totally lose our physical exam findings. 
And so we often can do spot EEGs between these um, between these uh, 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 temperature um, uh, gaps here, between these phases that we're using more uh, uh, more long term EEG. So this is yet another uh, way that we utilize um, uh, EEG in our institutions, depending on the institution that we're thinking about. Um, oftentimes our patients come in on a Friday evening or a Saturday or a Sunday or at night, and we don't have conventional EEG long-term or continuous EEG. So this is one way that we could put um, this device on quickly and an EEG and get a, a and get uh, answers uh, and a, a diagnosis very rapidly, and then oftentimes convert to more of a continuous uh, EEG for long-term monitoring. So I know I'm uh, probably moving pretty quickly here, but I do want to open it up for um, case discussions and case review uh, here for the last uh, few minutes. Um, and the the two highlights here are the cases that come to us um, the first one is in the Northern California area. This was uh, at a community hospital with limited EEG coverage. It was happened to be on a weekend. And uh, this patient was a young patient, a 39 year old female who was submerged in water for 15 minutes and had a cardiac arrest um, pulled from the water. She was resuscitated aggressively with return of spontaneous circulation. And it was decided at that time uh, that the patient go uh, under induction and targeted temperature management. Uh, an EEG was applied to this patient uh, early on, and um, it was um, noted that this patient had hypo, uh, excuse me, that this patient had non-convulsive status epilepticus. And the patient was treated uh, very rapidly and, and very aggressively. And lar it, despite that large doses of uh, Midazolam and propofol, diprovan, um, they were able to titrate uh, these medications appropriately. Um, so this patient uh, then uh, came out of non-convulsive status. And, you know, the patient's awake uh, and following commands um, after this and certainly has a long road ahead of her. But um, I think this was a huge win for the bedside clinicians and the bedside providers, but most importantly, the patient. Case two is an EEG application um, that uh, this was a hospital. So this is actually, I, I love this story. This was sent to us by uh, a neurologist in, in uh, Alabama. And this was a, an academic hospital that did not have continuous EEG. Um, but this patient was a 74 year old male. He came in through the emergency department um, had a syncopal episode, um, but was otherwise admitted to the hospital, slightly confused. Um, and while in the hospital, he had a V-fib arrest, um, was aggressively resuscitated. Um, and it sounds like the team did an excellent job, but ultimately they decided to put this patient on hypothermia protocol, heavily sedated. And, um, you know, complicating this was the patient developed shock and went into acute renal failure. Uh, CT of the head showed no acute findings. Now, as the patient was cooled and then uh, went through 24 hours of hypothermia and then rewarmed, uh, the patient really wasn't waking up as uh, appropriately thought. Neurology was consulted, and uh, this was a stroke center. Uh, neurology was consulted, and um, uh, EEG was placed. And immediately on the EEG, um, there was noted to be uh, seizure-like um, activity. And this was um, identified uh, via the, um, certainly the EEG waveforms, but on the other aspect of this was this uh, algorithm called Clarity. And this is a, um, an AI algorithm that takes these waveforms here and transforms it into a very visual aspects for you know, clinicians like myself or bedside providers and nurses can look at this and clearly identify um, this idea, is this patient seizing or should I treat them or not? So to orient you to this slide here, I would like you to look at the top here, which is the left hemisphere and the wave patterns associated with that on EEG and the right hemisphere here um, associated with the wave patterns. And 
where you see this blue line here correlates to what you're visualizing here on the screen. And so you can, we can fast forward this and you can see the blue line uh, start to move here. Um, and if I were to go back uh, on this uh, one more time, I'll play this, but essentially uh, you can look at the wave patterns that have changed and certainly the AI algorithm. Now, if we zoom in on this, um, this uh, clarity algorithm and the wave patterns that we saw for this patient, um, you can see that uh, uh, medications were given. So this was the start of the EEG here that, uh, that was identified, the start of the EEG. And very clearly, this patient was noted to be uh, having seizure-like episodes. They called, promptly called the neurologist, which uh, was given Ativan. And then you can see that this progressive buildup of seizures then reoccurred. And then again, um, sorry here, one second. Mm -hmm. And then, and then the patient was loaded with phosphatidoin at 3:29 p.m. The seizures subsided here, and then again, sort of rebuilt themselves until another dose of Ativan was given. This was a real-time way in which this patient was managed bedside uh, with EEGs. But it certainly highlights the fact that our patients, um, if we're not monitoring our patients with any EEG. After our cardiac arrest, I think um, we, we perhaps are not doing the right thing for our patients. But at the end of the day, uh, I think the American Heart Association has come out with these wonderful guidelines to help guide our therapy and say, look, we should be monitoring these patients with EEG more frequently and more often. So, so really, in summary, uh, I know this was brief and I know this was short, but really, in summary, I hope that uh, this highlights a few things and probably raises more questions than answers, but we, we reviewed the cardiac arrest patients. Um, some of the literature around that it certainly wasn't a robust literature review, but it was a literature around cardiac arrest patients, uh, the prevalence of seizures in this patient population, the newest guidelines for 2020, and then the utilization of EEGs. And I'm sure that many of you on this call might have even had cases yourself where um, uh, status or non-convulsive status was identified early uh, and, and often with EEG. So um, that's the extent of this talk today. Here are some of my references um, that you'll see here. And uh, I wanna just give my um, email out to anyone on this call, feel free. Um, to email me anytime, feedback, cases, anything that, um, that you think is relevant. I would love to connect with you all. So please, anytime, email me. Um, and thank you for your time today.